I'm Robert Ashley, the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. I'm from a council estate. So my first stabbing at 11, I see a first shooting at 15. There's loads of other stuff I couldn't talk about on here. Going to school at eight years old, seven years old, even younger, and there'd be heroin needles and sick. I remember my mom, one of the things sticking in my head, my mum saying to me, see that? that's what happens when you first do drugs. See all the sick everywhere. I used to go, oh, it's a stink. You know, if you don't touch them needles, you get AIDS. People run things down they don't understand. Yeah, that's true enough. That's, yeah, yeah. that's what happens. You run down table tennis because if you like football, what's that fucking game? Who plays that muggy fucking game? Table tennis. You play it, you get into it, you think it's a fucking good game. Andrew Tate on chess, he's a fucking genius. People start listening to chess now because I've got respect for him. Yeah. But look how his brain works. He fucking works like he's a chess player. You're taking away the connection of love. They're going to go and do more drugs, more alcohol. We need to reconnect with our addicts and sit down and say, I want to sit with you. If I can be here for you anytime, I'll sit with you. The environment of a past experience or a trigger will send you back into that place and you're gonna you can't think great in your emotions so the unconscious mind is that is where the work that's, that's where the change happens that's where the magic happens the value comes from the vision that you have in the first place you can feel what you want to achieve you know how great it's going to be when you get there so this is the this is the importance of visualization through visualization when you're in that state is the most powerful state to rewire your brain you'll start making new feelings you you start to Rehearse the emotion of who you're going to be before you are it. So you should learn to feel like you're a non-addict before you become a non-addict. So it's got to work. I've got to feel like a millionaire before I can become a millionaire. Your RES system's a human, a human sat nav. So if you want greatness, you want better things, you've got to show the RES system this vision. That's what the, that's what the final destination is. It will generate information. You'll be learning without knowing you're learning. You'll be having conversations, asking questions of someone, not realizing it's the RAS system doing that so it can work out the information for you to get your goal. It does make sense because the rich were once the rich and the poor once the poor, but people are waking up. So fuck them and start becoming a creator. Welcome back to the Dozen Podcast. This week we've got Robert Heisey. Robert is the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist and you will see during this conversation what I've seen for the last several hours having the pleasure of being in his company he is a highly functional human being with a real good insight into the mind and he speaks quick as do I but it's well worth keeping up with every single syllable that you hear because I guarantee this is going to be an interesting conversation and it's going to help a hell of a lot of people. So thank you for coming. Thank you and thank you for today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And already I'm thoroughly enjoying the experience. So yeah, this is we're rolling into this on a real, on a real buzz, a real buzz. So the first question I want to ask you, you're the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. Yeah. So before I ask the question, actually, I just want to tell you how you come onto my radar. So Daniel O'Reilly, Dapper Laughs, and nod to you, Dapper, for doing what you're doing, the menace to sobriety. Got a lot of respect, a lot of love for that. And since you've launched it, I've been watching it. Not that I'm battling with sobriety, but I just like what he's doing because it's helping and supporting other people that desperately need it. And they haven't quite got the support network to speak out loud comfortably about it. So all they can do is they can tune into Menace to Sobriety and they can get their feed of what they need and hopefully put it into place, put it into action, and it will just ease their pain and help them. So fair play to you, uh, Daniel, for that. And I dare say you'll be sitting where Rob is uh, in time and we'll also have a good conversation and we'll help each other. So I watched you on Menace to Sobriety on the podcast and I loved it. I was glued. It was only, it was the quickest hour that went past of my life. I liked your vibe. I liked the way you spoke, the way you communicated, the way there was no airs and graces. And you explain things in a way that I understand them. So you get a psychotherapist and they come at you with a load of mumbo jumbo, a load of very formal words, very psychological words that you can only learn and understand and comprehend if, if you've been to, the, into the, been to the school of psychology and you understand the jargon, same as anything, but you broke it down and you simplified it and I got everything you said. And I thought, wow, this is a real captivating man, which is why I've reached out to you. Not the other, you haven't reached out to me, I've reached out to you and said, please, I'd love you to come on The Dozen Podcast. I'm launching it. I want you to be one of the first people to come on. I want to pick your brain. I want to learn from you. So that's how I spotted you. I was instantly a fan, bam, love what he does. He breaks it down, he filters out the shit and he delivers it in such a fashion that to me it just seems universal. So I think the world needs to hear how you break complex stuff down into simplistic terms, which 
essentially helps. So that's how I spotted you. So thank you for accepting my invitation. What is unconscious mind therapy? Unconscious mind therapy is um, a therapy that I've, you know, I put a blend of all my learnings together. And to put into a nutshell, there's nothing more powerful than the unconscious mind in your life, yeah? So everyone talks about cognitive, behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, you're all dealing with a conscious mind. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, there's not a human being alive can think greater than how they feel. And your body, your heart, your emotions is your unconscious mind. So just say, if you're feeling anxious, your brain's gonna check in with the body and go, you're feeling anxious right now. I've got to make more correspondent thoughts. There's never been a human being in two million years while experiencing the emotion of sadness could make a happy thought. If you feel sad, you make sad thoughts. If you feel anxious, you make anxious thoughts. If you feel confident, you make confident thoughts. Yeah, I can do that, it's easy, let me have a go. Um, and that's the difference. We can't, we can't think greater than our emotions. And the problem is that most people are a record of the past, yeah? But we, we're taught to just record the past. And when you're a record of the past, when you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you have a shower, you drive to work the same way, and you make a thought like you did today, 87% of our thoughts are the same thoughts you made yesterday. So the minute you make a thought of yesterday, you're accessing that chemical emotion. So that means you're the same person you was yesterday. If you're thinking within the chemical boundaries of how you feel. So looking at the unconscious mind, we have to change our mental, our, not in our mental state necessarily. We have to use our conscious mind. We can use our subconscious mind or we can use just our, our unconscious mind, yeah? But what has to change for you to go from feeling sad to happy is the unconscious mind. If you have to feel um, a phobia for getting on the plane, you have to change your emotion. If I remove your emotion of fear when you get on a plane, you can't make a fearful thought. Try it. You know, think of... Um, Think of your blue T-shirt and try to feel scared. It's impossible because you've got no neuro association to it. So I look at the unconscious mind because we can only think how we feel. We can't think greater than our emotions. Two, the unconscious process is the same in everyone's brain. The process to de depression is the same in everyone's brain. The process to anxiety is the same. The content, what we do like with psychotherapy, is like looking for a needle in an haystack. Even if you do fucking find it, what are you going to do about it? Some of my clients come into me and go, oh, Rob, you know, I really want to understand the root cause of the problem. I go, okay, well, let me tell you what happened. Your dad done this. You felt neglected. Your ex-girlfriend done that. Boom, boom, boom. Now what are you going to fucking do about it? And they look at me as if I'm nuts. What are you going to do about it? That's the cause of the problem. What are you going to do about it? You want to know it. That's it. Then now what? And they look at me... What the fucking hell is that, is that going to help you? So we can sit and analyze with psychotherapists and counselors why you're fucked up for six weeks and then they send you on the way and go well now you understand it you can be aware be more mindful before it happens it don't work like that because the environment the people around you um, tv programs you watch objects associations are fired off in through it for anything can fire off an association and the minute that association saying fired off you access that emotion you're fucked you're thinking how you feel so I don't care if you read every book you want on anxiety the minute that anxiety hits your chest you're the body's bitch the mind's now become you know, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the master's become the servant. Your body's controlling you. You can't think greater than your emotions and the environment now is telling you how to think because that's the environment of uh, a past experience or a, a trigger will send you back into that place and you're gonna, you can't think greater than your emotions. So the unconscious mind is, the, is where the work, that's, that's where the change happens. That's where the magic happens. So you're saying that how you feel will trigger your emotions. Something can trigger how you feel. So, so say you could be talking about something and it could trigger off a memory. So you know, like music, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is a neuro association. So say... What is a neuro association? Because some people will, will, just won't understand what... Pevlar's dog. You know Pevlar's dog? No. Well, some Russian scientists had a, a, a job of um, studying um, the saliva gland in a fucking dog, right? So what they've done is they had a little chip in its mouth and every day he rung the bell, ding, ding, ding. The little junior would walk in, get the, the puppy out of the cage, take it in the kitchen area, wherever it was. He'd unscrew the, the pedigree chum, say, put it in a bowl, put it on the floor. The dog would smell it. And on the computer, they'd, they'd monitor the saliva gland. As the dog ate it, they'd monitor how much saliva it released, yeah? This went on for several days, you know. It takes normally 30 days to make a neural pathway. But after that four-week process around that time, the, the guy rings the bell dog started slivering, not like it could smell the food, like it was about to eat it. And, and the scientist, well, listen, change it. 
change the chip, we think something's wrong. So change the sensor in the dog's mouth, ding, 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 same thing. What happened, my mouth's what we know, I've told this story so many times, right? <laughs> um, what happens is, um, every time for 30 days, the dog heard that bell, the man always walked in after hearing the bell, religiously, picked the dog up, took it out of there, the dog smelled it, then ate it. Once, once it becomes a, a, a program, once it becomes an habit, if you like, once you get that neural association, it moves from your, the act, the act of doing something again and again and again, it runs from your conscious mind into your um, subconscious mind as a program. Now, as the dog hears the bell, the brain goes, this is what's happening, fact. So now it believes that's 100% true, yeah? So now the dog starts to saliva because it knows the food's coming. It doesn't have to see or feel it. So now what's happened is the dog's made a neuro association to the bell to get fed and eat food. So now the dog's salivaing over a sound. How fucked up is that? The dog's salivaing over a sound. Why you shouldn't saliva over sounds? But that's what, and that's what you'd do. If I, every time you ate, right, for a month, I rung a bell before you ate your food, I could ring that bell in your mouth, which is full of saliva. Every human being would do it. We're no different than animals, yeah? That's a neuro association. Or have you ever had a bit of music, right? where you you put a bit of music on, it takes you back to when you're 18 and you're dancing at some party on a table with your pals and you hear that song, right? And they, you go 10 years without hearing it and all of a sudden you're driving along, um, boom, the song comes on the radio. The tr instantly, the image hits your mind. So you get an external sound, internal image, and then your internal emotions start to feel how you did back at that party. You feel like, oh, that's fucking Terrible. good days. You're so sure. yeah, that's a neuro association and everything we do, so, shifts into your subconscious and unconscious mind. So if you think about when you have a driving lesson, you first get in the car, your five senses, how we make our three-dimensional map of the world is for our five senses, hearing, seeing, smell, taste, and feelings. When you first get in the car, you can't wait to drive, but you've got a little butterfly in your stomach because your senses are going mad. You've got, you're feeling your foot, you're feeling your hands, you're listening to the sound of the engine, you're looking where things are, looking at the road, you're indicating, like, it's overwhelming. You, you don't do things like that, you just walk, yeah? And all of a sudden, you go, like, clutch down first gear, like, rev, clutch up to bite and point, a bit more rev. It's all very cognitive, yeah? But once you do that for a month, say, or, you know, several days, whatever, as it starts to, we start to memorise it. Then it goes from our conscious mind into our subconscious and unconscious minds. So then what we do is we're driving down the phone. I've been nicked loads of times on the phone. What's happening, mate? Who's around? I've got my phone on my ear thing. What's happening? Yeah? All right, mate. Yeah. Speak to you later. Tell mate. What gear are you in? I ain't got a fucking clue. I'm, not, I'm doing my clutch. Did you indicate it? I know, did I? Yeah, you indicated. Can't you fucking tell them on the phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't you? Yeah. I'm busy. Don't, don't speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm on the phone, you rude. Yeah, but it's, do you know what I'm, I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. You don't realise that now you don't think about it. You don't think about ringing a doorbell. You don't think, right, put my hand in and press that button. You have to learn to press at some point. So everything we do is based on neuro associations. Um, so neuro, neuro association is... A trigger. Also known as autopilot. Yeah, it can be autopilot. To, to, to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, neuro association could be that. But then we've got like subconscious programs that run like computer programs. Um, yeah, talk to me about them. Subconscious program. It shifts. It. You do it automatically without thinking. You walk subconsciously, yeah? They're programs that are running automatically, yeah? Talking is like a subconscious program, if you like. But we have some conscious programs we do when we work. You know, um, subconsciously, you might walk out to the kettle, walk up to the kettle in the morning, pick up the kettle, put it under the sink, put it back, press it with your index finger, not your thumb, then go and get the milk out. Some people's program will be they'll get up every morning, open the door, pull out the milk, and then go and get the kettle. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. that becomes you won't even know you're fucking doing it, yeah. But they they become subconscious programs. You've done that 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 way so many times that you don't even realise. Like I remember years ago, I used to come down into my front room, the stairs, the sofa would be there. I'd lean over, turn the telly on, fuck knows why, walk in and have my breakfast, walk out and turn it off, go back upstairs with shower. Now, like, and I remember clocking it and thinking I've got to break that pattern because I love challenging myself because. What, we become creatures of habit and we, we want to be comfortable and that makes us weak. It makes us, you know, predictable. Human beings are predictable. I can meet someone for 10 minutes mm. and tell what they're doing in 10 years' time. Pretty easy, especially after the age of five, for, after the age of 35, 90% of what we do is subconscious programs. So that means we're only using 5% of our conscious mind. Everything else we do is like robotic. We don't even know we're doing it. We're scared to change. We, we have the same holiday to the same place at the same time or, you know, people get very... Um, they don't like change. And the reason for they don't like change is because the unconscious in us, the, the, the animal mind, the caveman mind, likes to predict where we are. Because if you can predict that you're feeling depressed at six o'clock tonight, there's not a lion or bear eating you. So it feels safe knowing that you're going to be depressed at six o'clock. Does that make sense? It, so it, we've got to change these programs up. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And the fact that you make absolute sense of the subconscious mind and statistically 
And you're the saying, and, and, Every, yeah, and, sorry, has and, to change. Yeah, and the unconscious mind. Sorry, I've had therapists. Mark, oh, Rob, well, I've had this uh, Marley Street before. Therapist, okay, you keep talking about the unconscious mind. Well, you have to consciously think of a vision. That's what you're saying, Rob, about visualizing. I go, yeah, I consciously think of vision what I want. But what happens then when you fucking visualize? What happens to your body? Um, yeah, you start to feel like the person you see, but well, that's your unconscious mind. Bang, well, that's why I changed it. You have to learn to feel greater than who when you are. Before when you're you rattling off the way you do, because it's so programmed within you that that knowledge is embedded in you now, yeah. which is such a great tool to walk around with. And, I mean, you must, your mates must love you. And there's certain bits, when you're talking, my lips are going, so I'm thinking, I get that, I get that, and I do that, and I say that, and I think that, and I see that. So my example was, when I said about being in touch with the unconscious mind, and you said 95% of people over the age of 35, it's they basically, unconscious or subconscious they programs. stay stagnant. Mm. So there's a good reason why you and me are mid forties, we'll say. We'll keep, we'll keep, yeah, we'll keep it, we'll, 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 we'll keep it concerned. Yeah, yeah. So I'm 43, you're 46. But you and me are still moving forward. We still yeah. got, we still got plans ahead. We still got goals. We Always still got dreams, that. aspirations, and we're still looking for new connections, which is so healthy to keep meeting people and evolving. But what I was going to say is, and this makes absolute sense with the statistics that you've given me, I look around. I'm a, I'm a people watcher. I love nothing more than sitting there with a coffee in a shop front window and just watching not just the world go by, but people go by. And I wonder what their story is, and I wonder what they're thinking, and I wonder what they're feeling. But I look at people that I went to school with, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit closer to them people than I am the, the people that I'm looking past me in a coffee shop. Hmm. So there's more of a connection there. And so I'm more concerned about them because I kind of know them. And probably 95% of the people that I went to school with that are my age now, 43, they appear to be beat. They're where they are. They're where they have been for the last 10, 12 years. They've got no more ambition, no more drivers. almost like they're just in the waiting room, it's waiting for it all to you're, end. You're programmed from the church, from the church and everything. I mean, listen... What I mean by the churches and evolution in in all is that first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby in a baby carriage. Admit it, you know, admit it as a, a little girl's fucking old enough. She's still got a nappy on, by the way. And then we can't wait to give our little daughter a baby, like a little doll. Yeah. And then you're subconsciously programming her to be a mum. Then when she's 16 or 15 and she gets pregnant, you go, you fucking slag, you put a shame on the family and they come to life out of her. Hang on a minute. You've been programming her to be a fucking mum. Couldn't wipe her own ass and she's fucking holding a fucking baby in her arm. Like, yeah. give her a fucking break. What do you, what do you expect to happen? You know? And we're programmed to first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby and That's, a baby carriage. That is powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. Well, of course, how many people will be watching this have ever thought about it like that. Yeah. How many people will, how many people out there, how many fathers that have got a daughter that fell pregnant at 16 and they're, and they at, and they're, yeah. they're in bits. They can't believe that their you've daughter, their your angel. Life. You've ruined your life now. You could have gone and trained. But you've been programming her subconsciously since she's fucking, before she can wipe her own ass. Uh, got a fucking nappy on. Mama, mama. It's one of the first things she fucking says. I'm real. And it's mental, isn't it? It's, and then, yeah. And the problem is as well with, with children, is that up to the age of seven, we're living in what they call theta state, yeah? Which is our brain waves are running from eight to 16 hertz. Now we're in beta state, which means our brain's running from eight to six, so no, sorry, four to eight hertz in theta. We're like between eight and 16 at the moment. So that means we've got an analytical mind. What, theta, what's that? It's, it's is like, that a measurement? Theta state is the brain waves. Theta. Stuff. Yeah, like, a ba like babies. Theta, that was the theta. council in me coming out. Yeah, theta. No, it's good. Th yeah, me, yeah, <laughs> theta, mate. Not FIFA, theta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, theta, theta state is like when you're a baby to, to your like seven. When they say, you know, give me, a, give me a child up to the age of seven, I'll show you the man. That's because they're living in a state of hypnosis. Yeah, they're in a state of mirroring. We've got mirrors in our system. So when we're up to the age of seven, eight years old, we watch our mum and dad and we learn mannerisms. We learn habits that ain't ours. We learn to, you know, they reckon most people drink in habits. A lot of people drink those by the age of seven has already been installed. Mimicking. Yeah, because at the age of seven, your mum and dad would sit on the table, have dinner and have a glass of wine. They put the, they put the bottle on, they put the cork back in and tomorrow they have a bottle, one glass each. The kids normally grow up to have one glass of wine with a dinner. They don't. But if you're an old man's boozing all the time, not all the time, because you do get the opposite, sometimes it can pattern break, but 90% of the time, the kids are going to end up with the same drinking habits. Yeah? So... It's, it's, it's amazing how complex the phrase monkey see, monkey do actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, to how, you, listen to how you've just yeah. explained. And it, like, also known as monkey see, monkey do. But yes. that, so, it, it's so complex yeah, and, so and, and entwined. Yeah, it's true. Because 
up to the age of seven when we were in theta. What this way? This is why hypnosis and meditation is so powerful for reprogramming. Because what we've got to do is see, like now, subconscious programs and unconscious programs in your in your mind will be your voice will be going. Well, I want to change. I need to change today. I've had enough of being a wanker. Right? The f Sorry. The first, the first thing to do is to change. We've got to admit that we're fucking idiots, right? And, you know, if you're fat, admit you're fucking fat. We can't change it until you admit it. Or if you've, if you've been an arsehole and you're embarrassed and ashamed, hold that shame because that's the only point you can start to change. Own it. But so in theta state, we're mirror, we've got mirrors, yeah? So yep. we're watching what we do. We learn habits and, uh, and, and things like that. So when we go into hypnosis and meditation, we're going beyond the analytical mind. So this is what I'm talking about, the analytical mind. So when you say to yourself, if I said to you now, right, you play football, say, and I went, listen, if you don't do your own work on this every night, you ain't playing fucking Saturday, right? And your dad said that to you, or someone said that to your parent, you'd go, your brain would go as a teenager, well, I don't really want to play Saturday, it's fucking raining, so fuck your own work. Or you could go, well, you know what? I really want to play Saturday, so the pals will go to the pub and mates after. You analyse the situation, you make a choice. We have choices, basically, after the age of seven and eight. But up to the age of seven and eight, we don't really have choices. We live in theatre state. We're like, we're copying, we're mirroring. So when you say to a kid of six years old, you don't do your own work, you ain't playing your computer Saturday, what that kid will do is probably not do his own work, but we still go, yeah, play computer still Saturday anyway. So then we fucking confuse them, deep, deeply confusing them Why are we programming because we expect our children to understand choice at the age of five or six they don't understand choice so they, they, they'll do what you tell them they're programmable you're great you're amazing this is why it's so good to converse with better, children better, and tell them better still, how amazing you are better still they'll do what you do if you was to sit there and yeah. say right we're now doing our homework it wouldn't be questioned or no. challenged it would just be this done we do yeah it would just we, be done Yes, and it'll become a program and a way to live their life after. So your habits will basically affect your, your children's habits. So it's so important, which I wish I knew this when my kids were uh, young, you know, all, not all of them, but, you know, my oldest one and, and Jude and stuff. I wish I understood this stuff more then. When because did you start understanding this? What what, what I want to know I'm is, and, and, and uh, there, there's a few topics that I'm, uh, we're going we're gonna to definitely hit home on because it will give people a good explanation as to why they feel a certain way, why they're drawn to certain things, why they're hooked on certain things, why they're a slave to certain things, because you're a solution man. You've got, you've got answers, which is, which is phenomenal. But what made you, I want to know what, what, made Robert Heisey want to delve deeper into the mind and just not settle for the thoughts that were coming into your head uncontrollably. What made you go hang about? I want to know more about these thoughts and the mind and the subconscious, unconscious part of it. What made you delve into that? Mate, well, I wasn't that clever at the beginning to even think about that, yeah. The truth of the matter is I'm from a council estate. So my first stab at 11, I see a first shooting at 15. There's loads of other stuff I couldn't talk about on here. And so I come from a very lower working class. So people go, I'm from working class. I look where they live. I think that's fucking middle class from where I'm from. Yeah. So that's, you know, I'd love to live there. That's posh. You had an ass. <laughs> fucking hell, mate. Yeah, Joe. Like, so first of all, I come from a really poor background. And where, and where, um, where do you come South from? South London, Bermondsey. Yeah, Bermondsey, South London. Bermondsey, yeah. Um, SC1. And, um, was it a rough neighbourhood? Yeah, rough, rough estate? Terrible. What yeah. was the, What was the estate? The Bonhomie estate. They've got a new Bonhomie now because they knocked our one down. But it was really rough. Um, I learned to drive on there. We were on nick cars. It's back in the 80s when joyriders were easy. You can nick a motor just by putting a little scaffold power over the barrel, snapping it and put a screwdriver in it. It was fucking easy. I used to nick motorbikes every day. When I get my cars being nicked, you know, I, I, I think it's calm and that. Whenever everything gets nicked to mine, I think serves me right. Because I used to see them old granddad 90s kick the fucking steering lock off and just pull the wires apart. It used to kick start. So it was like, it was it was a joyful time to be fair. There was loads of fun there. It was like a playground, but also it was a very violent and a poor a poor place. So and to give people a rough idea of the estate that you're from, correct me if I'm wrong. The film Nil by Mouth, Nil by Mouth, yeah, with yeah, Ray, yeah. With Ray, Ray Winston, Winston was yeah, shot yeah. on that exact yeah, on estate. That estate, yeah. And that was if you've seen Nil by Mouth, Ray Winston, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a powerhouse of a film and it's very it's dark. Powerful, yeah. But have a look at that, and that's where there, Rob there's comes a scene, from. There's an easy scene. If you type in Neil by Mouth and scroll down, you'll see Ray Winston throwing a brick through the window, trying to get to his ex mister That's the Bonhomme estate there. Yeah, it's a proper proper rough place. And um, you'll see it's very grey, dark, sinking floors. It was on, built on marshlands. There's always puddles everywhere, moss. A lot of drug um, addicts. Loads of drug heroin lot addicts. Of heroin so needles in the kid, stairwells. I used to come down the stairwells, holding my mum's hand, going to school at eight years old, seven years old, even younger, and there'd be heroin needles and sick. I remember my mom, one of the things sticking in my head, my mum's saying to me, see that? That's what happens when you first do drugs. See, it was sick everywhere. I used to go, oh, I used to stink. 
And they trying to touch them needles, you get AIDS, because at the time, the AIDS virus come out and people were, it was dead. They weren't like now, they can in the forever. 80s, the, in yeah, the 80s, years, the 80s, 80s years, scene, all skinny yeah. people walking around. Nowadays, if people have AIDS, they're all muscly, you give them growth hormone, they're all fucking ripped to fuck. But you don't, you know, you don't see them. But when someone says to you nowadays, you look like you've got AIDS, you take it as a right compliment. Yeah, compliment. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cheers, bro. <laughs> yeah, but back in the day, it was. If you were skinny, go, oh, he looks like he's got AIDS. Yeah. Him, like when you was a kid, but you, they were skinny. When someone says, you know, somebody looked like they had AIDS, you picture a skinny, you picture yeah. Freddie Mercury on his final video yes. being yes. propped up by the stick. Yes, exactly yeah. what you, exactly is nowadays, it's completely different. The and basically you can live a normal life with it now, yeah? So how old were you when, so the estate you grew up on, flats, there's stairwells, there's used heroin needles, there's spoons, I'd imagine where it's been cooked up, there's crack pipes, all that paraphernalia. Yeah, yeah. Did you witness that at, at those years between one and seven? I would have witnessed the needles and drugs, yeah, on the states. I would have witnessed that, yeah. Which will indicate that you could mental, have quite, you, mental, you, you could real have, mental, and they lived underneath You me. could have quite easily gone on to think, well, that's the norm, so I'm going to have some of that. Yeah. But, easily. Easily, but in, in fairness, one of the good things that happened to me, I had a, um, a babysitter, I loved her, and I can roughly remember still, she was, when I was really young, so all through that sort of age, her name was Teresa, and um, she was a lovely girl, she used to look after me, and I remember going out and say water fights in the summer, rough, little vague memories. And then she got to like 15, 16, and she'd become heroin addict. Mm. And I remember seeing her one day, all spotty. She looked horrible, and she was putting faces at me like nasty. And it was like, you know, I remember holding my mum's hand, being scared. And she went, oh, I remember she died at 16, some geezer over West End. She overdosed, and the geezer robbed her. Um, and she died. I remember that being a for heroin. Like, I think my generation was lucky because it was when Skag was at its worst. And my age group grew up wanting to bash Skag heads up. It was a yeah, dirty, yeah, yeah. Scumbags. Well, it, it, it was a, so if, if I you, think if, we, the, the heroin stopped on our estate from my, the new generations because we'd like, they'd all get ironed out and they all went off to some other dirty estate called Silwood. So there weren't no fucking Skag heads. Time I got to my teens and they'd all been, you know, they'd still get them walking about, but they'd get thrown, the people would throw things at them and just cunt them. Yeah, you're right you know saying I mean? that. If you wanted to, if you wanted I to really, lucky. if you wanted to really slight someone, you'd call them a smackhead. Yeah even, yeah, even if they weren't, and it was always the drug. You'd experiment with everything else, but be like, it, yeah. don't don't want to get on the yeah, smack and, because and you're you know a, a real low life. I've got friends that died even when I was in thirty. One of my pals got on there when he died, and mates were like, "Fuck, he might go into his funeral." Silly cunt. He knew what he was doing. He's a fuck because he did. At the end of the day, we hated skaggers, all of us. Yeah. Mm. So when he died of heroin, no one, like a lot of buds, we had no sympathy. They said, "Well, fuck him. What's he do that for?" I had no sympathy for it because we see that side. We see the bad side of heroin when we see the bad side of that so yeah people brought up more on path there's bits of acid and fucking you know coke everywhere and that's did you get stuff. involved in the acid scene no nah, because another guy called eugene another good thing that happened to my state he went mental it was um it was um golden trip just had a trip and fucking never stopped hallucinating. Never, 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 yeah, that's what, that's what called a golden, golden trip. trip yeah. yeah, golden trip. I've had people in the family, they've, 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 they've taken acid. Next thing you know, six months, they've they've become conscious again on a psychiatric ward and they've never, ever recovered. Yeah, never. It's done. a heavy duty, horrible. Anybody watching this that's considering taking LSD, don't. It's fucking naughty. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it's haunting. If you want to feel fear in its highest format, take acid, and take a bad turn on acid. You'll never ever want to do it again. In fact, you'll wish that you never ever done it, and you'll curse the day that you did. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, good job that you didn't. You didn't no, do that. I've done, I've done mushrooms and shit, so it's similar. But um, lucky enough, I microdosed before I ever went into the trip side, but and I blended it slowly. But I have you, done. I have you, done edged, you, you edged your way yeah, into hallucination. Okay, yeah, but if you do it, I've done it before. I had like three grams at once or something, and then, wow, so I didn't like it, man. It's dark. It's right, mm. yeah. Go, too, too intense. Yeah, it's too much, and I didn't like that. I don't like that feeling. So microdosing is good because it's, it's re actually, microdosing on magic mushroom is the best medicine for the brain as we know it. There's no drug been made better than magic mushroom psilocybin, and even, believe it or not, LSD in microdosing, what we're seeing on brain scans is phenomenal, curing um, depression, anxiety with one microdose. Now, microdose means you don't feel nothing, really. There's idiots out there going, ah, oh, selling microdoses, but they're doing 0.5 of a gram, people are getting wavy, you can't really go, well, you get synesthesia, which is your feelings and words and sights all get interacted and mixed up. So that shouldn't be the case. You shouldn't feel anything on a microdose. It should be like 0.2 of a gram, 0.1. And you should take it and you shouldn't what, feel what, anything. What, what, not even a slight alter of perception? Not really, not really. Any kind of buzz, you do, relaxation? You, you, probably will, you probably will do for a little bit of relaxation, but the idea is not to feel that. You don't need to. The idea mm. is, but 
you could the, the you should test your amount everyone's body weight is different you should test the amount it's like 0.1 0. i'd start off with which is i'd put like lion's mane mushroom bit or something into a little capsule you shouldn't feel anything and the brain's this listen you go on ted talks don't take my word for it go on ted talks youtube type in microdosing psilocybin or magic mushroom psilocybin psilocybin is what the mushrooms it so what happens is when you take a mush magic mushroom the stuff in it which makes you hallucinate is psilocybin but it ain't it's psilocin at first once it goes through your liver then it turns into psilocin um psilocybin because you can hallucinate off thc you can't you as well you can hallucinate, yeah anything i mean i have drugs. done so i know yeah, i, I, yeah, I know that and that's that's in in a plant cannabis that's in a plant yeah and it ain't about hallucinating on, on microdosing there's no you don't want to hallucinations it's no. not good there is they are doing studies on the um on big doses where they're putting people a, a blindfold over them a doctor a, a therapist is sitting with them and, they, and they're doing these trials they're amazing because we're releasing trauma we don't even know what the trauma is it's really good but then saying that you're better off doing the Wim Hof breathing for an hour and getting someone to take you through that because you still release DMT then and it's very similar it's all very similar let's go back to your estate because I'm I'm really interested yeah. in I'm really interested in what molded the man that can sit there and hold court the way you can with such a plethora of psychological knowledge because you thought when you was younger that you, I'll tell you, what happened, yeah. you, 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 you told me that when you were younger, you thought you were thick. To me, that I mean, you're a, you're just not, and you never were, because it would be impossible to be who you are it's, today it's all, if you were. But you obviously, yes, you you thought that you were. It's all, Why? Because I was dyslexic. Well, I am dyslexic, ADHD, dyspraxic. But did you know um, you had ADHD? There weren't no such there thing. Because there was no such thing, was no, there? No, I used to just get punished for not focusing and being aware and paying attention or putting effort in. I used to get punished for that all the time. Like the tensions, fucking and browser of teachers, I'd be mind to be drifting off a teacher. I remember, I remember actually really trying to learn, like massively trying to learn. So to get the fed up of getting bad reports and getting in trouble. I remember coming back, listening to a teacher, I talk about the second world war or some shit and I'd be listening, listening, listening. What did I just say? I see. I don't remember a fucking thing. Cause I didn't care about it. Because with ADHD, we can't focus on things that we don't care about. So, meaning emotionally connected to. So, Talk to me about ADHD so now, because yeah, because I know that I have a. I've not, I've not been diagnosed. I've not filled so in. I've not filled in any forms. I just intrinsically know. But so explain it to me so I can make more so sense what, of it. So what? It's in with us. What happens is, so the teacher would talk to me about the Second World War. Now, to me, my brain looks at Second World War in books. It's all grey, death. It's fucking boring. I don't get no emotional connection to it. My dad loved the Second World War because his dad was in it, my granddad, and and they all, my uncles who loved it. To me, it was fucking boring. I could not memorise anything. But if I was in history, then they talked about Muhammad Ali boxing, and I loved Muhammad Ali, yeah, Boom. I could remember every word. I could, I could tell you everything that the geezer said. I'd write four or five pages with bad spelling on it, and I'd get probably a little way for that little thing I just done. He'd go, I oh, see, see, when you, my school reports, ADHD school reports are normally, if you put his mind to it, he can achieve. He don't want to, he don't want to learn. He don't want to, he don't want to put himself out. But because in the things that I did like, no one in the class would beat me up, but I'd be so in it. I'd be seeing vivid visions. I could write a piece that's with all emotion and vision and in depth and just naturally. Because I loved, I loved it. So then I'd, then I'd be a higher achiever. So the thing with ADHD, the biggest learning is that you can't, you can't focus on things that you don't care about, care about, care about or connect to. I have to. <laughs> but when you connect to something you care about, it's got an emotional connection. We hyper focus, meaning we become stronger focuses, better focuses than anyone normal, what they call normal. Yeah. We, we're actually better at focusing, but only on things that we care about. Then we're like, got fucking autism. We can't stop thinking about it. So I'll get on my own nerves sometimes. I'll, try, I'll get something in me I don't want to learn. And then I wish I never fucking opened up that can of worms because I'm laying in bed thinking about it. I'll be going to work thinking about it. I'll be fucking watching YouTube videos and, you know, until I, I get there, it, it, I do my own editing, you know. ADHD is very bipolar traded as well because I either feel like I'm the king, I'm the best, I'm not, you know, I'm the bollocks, or I feel like a worthless piece of shit. I don't do that middle ground. So I've trained my brain to feel I'm the bollocks 80% of the time and I do come down still 20% of the time. But I spent most of my childhood in my 20s feeling like a worthless piece of shit and only 20% raising thinking I could be somebody and be something. So I had to learn to spin that round and that's the problem with ADHD. If you don't learn how to focus in the right direction, if you focus on what you ain't got on your problems, you have a focus. If you focus on something depressive, you're going to be a world's best depressive person because you can hyper focus and you can't get out of lock. But if you think about your goals, I'm going to do that, I'm going to achieve that, and that's what I'm going to do. And you stay focused to it, and that, you allow that to kick in. 
then no one's going to so, beat so, them. So it was, it was school due to the school reports and the teacher's diagnosis of you that you then thought... No, I'll tell you why I, I got into the therapy. Well, I, no, I mean, when, oh, when you, when you realised that there was a there, there was an attention deficit, for example, was it that was it school that introduced 30, you to no, that? I didn't even know what the fuck it was until I was thirty seven. I was around my cousins and a, a, a son come in, Joe, and he was like his first year. She went, Rob, he's gone up three grades in three months, taking this concert at ADHD. I remember looking at Joe, thinking, and uh, Joe's a lovely kid, right? He's lively, bit. All right, Nick calls his mum Nick, like to wind her up. I used to call my mum Jill to wind her up, like very similar, but. I was a bastard. I'd be smashing into fucking, oh, you know, stolen cars and sighting fires and I'd be all right. And I think, you know, I was 50 times worse than him. So what, was, hey, what is ADHD proper then, Nick? I didn't even really study it. No, she gave me this bit of paper. I was only a little eight five bit of paper. She went, read that. I sat there and I read it and it was like someone has just written a, a, a bit of paper on me. About you, yeah. Yeah, it was like, so, honestly, it was me. I was, I was reading me. That was 100%. Every single thing, not one bit was, I went... Nick, do you think I got ADHD? And she went, she went, oh, fucking much. And laughed and walked out at me. Because mm. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Like, you know? <laughs> and then I thought, fuck this. And I went home. It was about five or six o'clock. I remember it. I went up into the bedroom, put my laptop on. I watched fucking documentary after I, the ADHD. What is? I watched yeah, documentary yeah, yeah. after documentary after documentary until four in the morning, three in the morning. The time I woke up in the morning, there wasn't nothing I didn't know about children, ADHD, adult ADHD. You know, it was sinking in, mate. And I went right to the doctors and someone would be diagnosed. He sat there for an hour or two with his geezer. He asked me some questions. He went, you've 100% got it. And then I went to Maudsley. The geezer went, you report so thorough. I don't even have to re re-examine you. Like, you know, you've 100% got it. And Job done. So if, if like me, if you like a, if you like a song, you, you don't play that once. You play it a hundred times, times yeah. until everyone else around you is Go sick of it, it off. and you still want it on again. I remember, That's I remember me. Buffalo Stance. Remember that song, Nina Cherry. Nina Cherry, out. yeah. I was about eleven. I went to South, eleven, twelve. I don't even know, thirteen. I went to South of France with the school, and I, I recorded it on my cassette tape, both sides. I played it, recorded, right, played it again, recorded it, side it, just on repeat. I love the song. I listened to it on the Walkman. Like the same fucking song. Mm. Like, I do think I'm more autistic. I do think I go right into that zone. Yeah. HD and autistic traits in all, low, low all, early autism is very similar. Bipolar, ADHD, very similar. The difference is you don't want to kill yourself or you don't really keep, try to... We have got a high suicide rate with ADHD, more than someone normal, but it's, it's don't go to that level of bipolar, but it's very similar. We can be either up or we can feel down. Yeah, see, bipolar... See, that, that I can't relate to. I'm, I'm either... I'm either exhausted because I burn myself out being me, or I'm hyper excited. I'm in, I'm in hysterics. My missus will tell you, it's bedtime. It's half past ten at night, and we're laying in bed, and we're just about to try and go to sleep. I think of something that tickles me, mate. I end up in fucking hysterics for the next hour and a half. And then I start messaging my cousin what I find funny, and we're very much in sync. And, and he's sending laughing, again. he's sending laughing emojis. So I now know he's laying in bed laughing as well. And then it makes me laugh even, even more. more. Yeah. I lay in bed sweating, <laughs> my head hurts, and I've completely woke myself up, yeah. and I cannot fucking sleep because yeah, yeah. I'm in absolute hysterics. So I'm either sort of yeah, we well, can't sleep eight days too, exhausted, or I'm 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 just just absolutely elated with joy, and it's a weird one. But I've never ever I felt extremely sad. And bereft when I when I've lost loved ones. I mean, and and I and I don't accept a day of it now, and I and I'll never fully recover because I don't want to recover because I love them and I want to feel like they're still with me. So that little bit of pain, it comforts me. But I'm I'm not a down person. So when someone says to me that they're depressed, for example, I can't fully understand. I mean, I can certainly empathise because I have felt down in the past. But I know that there's clinical depression, and then there's also but well, there must be depression where you sort of, you trick yourself into thinking you're depressed when you're not actually depressed, you're just sad or you're not where you want to be in life. And it's maybe, I mean, how would you gauge the two? How would you give somebody some advice if they come to you and they said, I'm depressed? What questions would you ask them? So when your thoughts go from here and now to the past, here and now to the past, that's what depression is. When you take a bad past experience. So just to say that slowly, your definition of depression is living between the here and now and the past. And the past. But there's a percentage that you could be there. You could be there 70%, so you're more depressed than happy, but you wouldn't even be aware. You wouldn't call yourself depressed. Just, you know, life's a bit thin at the moment. But you are actually living in more of the depressed state than happy state. So if you think about when she's gone and met a new geezer and she's fallen in love again. So when you meet your missus, yeah, 
and you go out on the first date, right? You go book a date. So if you pulled the, you pulled your, I'm just making this up. You pulled your missus in a bar, right? You got a number in the week. You go right, fancy going out next Saturday, man? You know, I'll take you to, uh, I don't know, Gaucho's or something, right? She goes, yeah, right. Then it's all in the week. You, no matter how hard your week is, you don't give a shit about the trauma at work and how hard you're working because you're looking forward to Friday. You got that here and now to the future goal. You're like, right, I'm going out Friday. Boy, I bought this nice bird. I can't wait to see her. You go and buy yourself a new shirt. You know, Friday rocks up. You've got all your best aftershave on, your best clothes. Rock up as if you normally rock these clothes all the time. She's done the same thing and you go out and have a meal. And then you go out next week and maybe you want to go take away for the weekend. And then you start thinking, you know, you become a... And that's what happens. Then you get engaged and then you get married. And the couples are happy because they've always got these goals. Ain't you've had the baby and kids that it goes downhill because no one's brainwashed you how to be happy after that. First comes love. Then comes marriage, then comes the baby, and the baby carries. Then it's fucking heavy metal music, right? Because no one's warned you, but the kid don't sleep. <laughs> she, she don't, she, then it's she, Iron Maiden. Yeah. It's Iron Maiden, mate. She don't, <laughs> she don't want to roll about with you because she's stressed. And your uh, minds between men and women are different. Hmm. So then your minds are stressed, kicking with her. She goes off of bit of the other. You, men's hormones, more stressed we are, more we want sex. So God's put a rig in there. So that causes friction between the husband and wife. The kid's screaming all fucking night. Understanding your thoughts go from here and out of the past is depression. Now, anxiety is this, taking a bad past experience or bad learning. It doesn't even have to happen to you. You could have read it in a book, seen it in a movie. You could have learned at school or you, it could happen to your friend. And you so it is, sorry, is this the part of the podcast where anybody with an anxious disposition turn the volume up and listen carefully? Yes, yeah, so I explain what anxiety is. This is what you're going to psychotherapy or trying to figure out why you're anxious, right? Don't fucking matter what your content is. I don't care why you're anxious. This will be the process. You've taken a bad past experience, like elf anxiety. You can see your nan dying and choking, and then people get a phobia of it, and they start getting they can't swallow food, and they get a phobia of choking because they've taken a bad past experience that they learn. Now imagine it and mirror it itself, and then imagine it happening to the self or a loved one. So they think their kids might have cancer, or if you've seen a plane crash on a movie and you're on a plane, and when you're up there, you look out the window and you think. Fuck me, imagine like it did in, you know, that in that film when a plane crashed or you read a plane crash and people start visualising. I get a lot of clients do this. And they visualise their own funeral and the kids at their funeral. I've had that loads of times. And they make up this vision in their head that the plane crashes and the kids are at their own funeral. And they just get a like, shit of life out of self. The unconscious don't know what's real and what isn't. Brings the trauma of the experience of the plane crashing because uh, of the turbulence that's kicking in. And then they bank of the, the bank of the estate. So what they've done is taken a bad past experience that someone crashed on the plane and they visualize it in their future. So they throw it into the future, happening to them in another shape or form, and now you've got anxiety. Now every time you've got on the plane, you see that. So if someone's been stabbed on the bus, nine times out of ten, they'll see a bus and they'll get what they call PTSD, which is an anxiety, and you'll, you'll get scared of getting on buses because every time it brings back the trauma. That's why soldiers get it and stuff, yeah, with noises and sounds and things, yeah or times of day. So here and now to the future is where we don't want to skim past because this is where happiness is made. So when you've got a vision of, I don't know, winning a winning this boxing match and you win that boxing match, you're going to release the, your endorphins, dopamine, you're going to feel like the king. But tomorrow that's going to get a big fucking dip because now you've got no other fight. Fighters are depressed when they've, after they've won their fight, a few days later, a week, two later, they're in the gym training to, to stay fit. Boring. They train better when they've got a fight. When they've got something, a big goal at the end of it, I'm fighting for the world title, I've got to fight this next guy, I'm fighting in three months. They'll fucking train, they'll starve themselves, they become savages. It's easier for them to do it. They want to go through pain and suffering. When they've got no goal at the end of it, they fucking, uh, I'm in the gym, I'm, when am I going to get my next fight? They're always the boring, always moaning. It's like winner's depression. They've got yeah. what they wanted and now they've got nothing else and to fight for. And this is all, everything you do in your life, you will get that because as human beings, we're creators, we have to raise our fucking standards. And people go, oh, you don't want too much in life. What are you talking about? It ain't about material materialness it's about you're a fucking man or a woman you need to, if you're in that zone of happiness you have to raise your fucking standards there's nothing wrong about getting a five bedroom house and then desiring a 20 bedroom house if you want to it's a fucking bigger picture you're going to be happy trying to get there if you're living in that if you're if you just live in the the five bedroom house you've got and you think you know what i come off a council state this has to be what zooming ball five bedrooms you know what i've done it the minute you suffer that you're now living in the here and now now listen to this your brain makes fifty-eight thousand to sixty-eight thousand thoughts a day so because you ain't creating a future thought your brain's going to go and think of some shit record from the past right so if you're living in the here and now, you ain't creating thoughts. That means your your brain has to go into the here, into the past. That will cause you depression. And people living in the moment will look for drugs, um, 
um, prostitution, um, alcohol. They'll look for something in the here and now to create this feeling that they're missing from when they were achieving and then they'll become addicts and fuck it all up or they'll, they'll live in this zone. See, human beings are always happiest and best when they don't need anything, when they're going towards goals, when they're connecting to people, when they're creating things. Human beings are creators. Happiness is the, uh, the effect of moving forward. Happiness is the effect of achieving goals or on the way to achieve the goals, yeah? That is where happiness comes from. It lives there. It doesn't live in the here and now. It doesn't live in the past. So all these fucking idiots going, oh, you've got to be mindful. You no, know, Dave, the fucking meditation guy. Uh, you know, since I've been meditating, I've got no anxiety. I go, yeah, but you're still in the park on the dole for the last fucking five years. You know, I'd rather be dead than be. You live in the same day of your fucking life every day. You meditate, you got rid of your anxiety, but what are you fucking doing? What, are you, what have you done? You've, you know, you're telling people you ain't got anxiety. I bought, fuck off. You're still wearing the same socks yeah do you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> but, okay I'm glad it's got rid of your anxiety mate mm. but Buddha invented now what Buddha invented mindfulness to take away the anxiety as a place to sit to then create the things we desire to create the life you want to help people to change but it. you're predominantly saying live between the now and, and the, the future. future yeah that's perfect because yeah. if I'm having a good time like now I fucking want to be in the now yeah. But I do like living in the future because it gives me the goal. My mum daddy said, I'm the greatest. I'm the next heavyweight champion of the world. I'm the greatest boxer this world's ever seen. At 18, wins the Olympics in Rome. He ain't even a fucking professional boxer yet. He's an amateur. He said, I'm the greatest. The fuck do people thought you flashed by? We get knocked out. He stepped backwards. He was visualizing stepping backwards. Everyone said, you, you know, you're a coward. Stand the fuck like a man. He said, I'm too pretty to get hit. Yeah. He changed the history in boxing in the Olympics. No one's even a fucking aware of that. So Miami Daly was a visionary. When well, he, he brought the mindset he, to the sport, didn't he? he yeah, he brought, the, he brought the personality. You know, he was a visionary, not only in the ring. As a, Listen, when Miami Daly said, um, you know, I'm, when I, he's in interviews and he'll say things like, I'm so fast when I turn the light switch off, I'm in bed before the room's dark. Do you think he just made that up like a gangster rapper and freestyling? No, he, he wrote those poems. He wrote them. He, he programmed what he was going to be. And when he got, he, he was prepared for the interview. So when he was on telly, he could just bang, let one out, bang, let another one out. He, he designed himself as a TV personality as well. Probably more powerful than even his boxing, the way he touched people's hearts and stuff and the things he'd done for human, humankind. So one thing I'll quickly say is, when Miami Daly was 12 years old, he said, there was no TV for me. So my telly was in my head. When I was skipping in the gym, I'd be visualizing, knocking people out, winning the WBO belt and buying my mum and dad a house. And when I go out for running through the woods for an hour, I'd be knocking people out. I went out the WBA belt. So I was visualizing being world champion since I was 12. So when we got to the Olympics, he had programmed his body prior to the event. He, was, he had the emotional intelligence of a world champion when he was an amateur winning Olympics. He didn't want to win the Olympics. He see through the Olympics and he expected to win the Olympics because he was visualizing being the greatest. You can't see it you can't be it it's the truest sound i've ever learned right because when you look and look at this words are the language to the brain feelings are the language to the body so if you go to me tell me something that you ain't got now that you'd like in your life what i'd like to have in the future that i haven't got now i would like a sharper brain a fitter body and, right, and, a, and, and yeah, a bigger stop, heart on a, a big dip but this ain't gotta be Tools, mate. Yeah, let's just go through the bit, the, the better body you want, right? So right. close your eyes, yeah? Close your eyes and visualize the body that you want. Now you want to change your body from what it is now to where it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, go on in. How did that feel? Yeah, it felt nice. How did he feel? How did he look? The future you? Not too dissimilar to how I look now. Okay, so it's not... A, a, so a, little, a little bit tighter, a little bit broader, a little bit sharper. So you felt a little bit better? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because you was a little bit better than you are today, yeah? Yeah, So yeah. if you imagine someone that's um, not as in shape as you and to see their self in that image make them feel a lot better because you're only that far away. They could be that far away. That, do you know do what, you that's, know what that's, that, that was probably, yeah, that was probably not the best question to ask because I'm all, cause I've come, you know, the, I'm right at the end of my journey. I can see the finish line. If you'd have asked me, that, if you'd have asked me two years ago where what what I'd like in the future that I haven't got now when I was 18 point stone and fucking fat and very unhappy uh, within my day-to-day -day life I would have closed my eyes and you would have seen me glow and smile yes, exactly so yeah because so I'm see, almost there I know at the moment you're doing this podcast and you're doing it with passion you're taking a lot of time out your day your own hours you're giving me a lot of time you took me to the gym today you've conversed with me you know you, it's amazing what you've done nice and passionate yours so you want to see this podcast in the future being amazing because you won't be giving too much so much value to me Otherwise, yes, you've got a vision of this unconsciously somewhere for you to have this great podcast out there and to help reach out to people, whatever the outcome may be. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, so otherwise, yeah. you'll be fucking doing it. Right? No, of course. With so much passion. There's no way. I wouldn't do so, anything if I didn't, if there, there was go. no value. This is what I'm I saying. do everything with purpose. But the value comes from the vision that you have in the first place. You can feel what you want to achieve. 
you know how great it's going to be when you get there. So this is the, this is the importance of visualization is that what we have to do is, so you're already a long way down the line for most, as all the, tra you know, the, the traumas you've been through and how strong you've become, you know, and you've done a lot of that work, which really as well, keep your guard up because in contentment becomes the, you know, we're going to, we don't want to be there. So what you're doing is great. So after this podcast, we're going to re realize another podcast or do another thing. I know you're like that anyway. You've got fucking businesses. Yeah. Going yeah. On. This so is you're the, this, fine. This is the people that own. viewers. Yeah. yeah. So we, we need to find someone. Because I completely concur and agree. Yes. I'm with you 100%. So, so when you close your eyes and you visualize a future you or a future thing happening, you're feeling the emotion in the here and now. The more you practice that, the more you're transmitting that signal. When you transmit that signal in the quantum world, you're pulling these things towards you. But what people get wrong with the law of attraction is the word attraction generally feels like you're pulling things to you. Would you agree with that? The word attraction is like, I'm attracting it. I'm pulling it towards me. How would you think? Well, where I, would you, send, where well, would you th think the signal is coming from? Well, when I... When I think about the law or the power of attraction, I think if I visualize it hard enough, firm enough, with enough belief, I won't need to pull it in. It will just float to me. Exactly. That's what you should do. But a lot of people get it wrong. A lot of people hear the word attraction and think attract means pull in. So they're for like trying to, you know, they're, they're doing it with this strain. Stress. It, stress, strain, stress. They're trying to pull it, like get a rope and pull it to me. I need this to come to me, this money. And it ain't happening. They're creating more doubt that way. Yeah, no, so no, no. It's just like, I'm glad you said that because like a radio station, you send the signal out. You know, yeah. They tune into you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. go fucking looking for it. You wait. You just send out the frequency and it's easy. It's like the more what, easier it's like it feels, said, yeah. the more you send it out, exactly what you it's just like said. It's like what I said to you earlier. I want to put out. I want to give. Yeah. I want to pump out energy. If and you more, give, and you the attract. More, the more energy I pump out, the more energy you I give, the, the, more, the more love I the supply. More, the most successful people in the world are giving, giving, and giving more than anyone knows. Yeah? They're, oh, they're totally. giving. So when you give, you'll attract. That's how it works, you know? Um, we have to be on the frequency. So so, that, so that's something to consider. I know a lot of people want, 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 want. They want more. They need more. They feel they, they, feel they deserve more. Entitlement. We're, in a, we're living in a, in a time now where every motherfucker seems to be entitled. You're not. You, you get what you earn and you get back what you put in. So if you want more, give more. And I'm not talking about monetary terms. No. I'm talking about give your heart, give your soul, give your love, give your belief, give your compliments. Give, give, give and watch you'll start to receive that law of attraction that will come and find you, but you won't get it if you're selfish. You've got to be selfless to a certain extent. Give more and more will come your way. Yeah. Fair dues? 100%, mate, 100%. But we've not long come out. I want to say not long, a couple of years. That isn't long. We've come out of multiple lockdowns where people were trapped in their houses like animals. And there's a lot of people that not only are they still suffering with a hangover from their depression, they're still depressed, but also... A lot of addictions grew within those within that window of time because people resorted to raiding the fridge and then also drinking more and then taking more drugs to keep themselves to keep, you know drinking drugs our company so there's a lot of addicts out there talk about addiction tell tell people that are listening a lot of maybe addicts. maybe maybe how they how they become addicted to whatever the substance of choice is because there's always a reason why they become addicted or and how can they escape and overcome addiction because that's all got to be part of the unconscious state of mind massively on subconscious program isn't it it's a, you know we're like robots so addiction don't have to be from escape it can, addiction can be just trying to be with your mates trying to act the big and start smoking before you know it you've done it so many times it becomes a subconscious program and your body thinks better than you do then you go and get a fag. Your body craves the fag. You do as you're fucking told. So that's as easy as it can be made. Some people do, a lot of people drink to escape from their emotion. We disconnect from the world. Addiction is um, not about sobriety. It's about connection. And there's proof to, to, to show this now. There's evidence. Have you ever heard of the story of Rat Park? Have you heard of that? No. Where there was a scientist years ago was looking at addiction, yeah? And they put cocaine some even with heroin and one with water. And they put a rat in a cage. Yeah, and the rat always went to the heroin or cocaine and 100% died, right? They put another rat in there. You know, don't matter how many rats they put in this cage, they all fucking went for the cocaine or the heroin and they all died, yeah? Then later on, 20 years later, saying someone went, when, you know, psychology is growing and people thought like environmental psychology. 
But look at the fucking environment the rat's in. There's nothing in that cage except for water, a bit of, you know, in its own shit, and the, and the, and the drugs. It wasn't connected to nothing. There was nothing in there for it. Why didn't the rat go to the water? Because it wanted to disconnect. It's in the environment. It was empty. There's nothing in there. So what happened is, in the second, this, this guy years later said, let's build rat park. So he's done this two-story cage, right? He put female rats in there, get as much sex as it want, as much cheese as it wanted, loads of wheels and toys for it to fucking play with, and it put the heroin, the coke, and the water. It went for the water 90% of the time. Very rarely did it touch the coke and the heroin. Very rarely. Because it was in a connected environment, yeah? And then they put another rat in. Guess what? It's the same result. So looking at humans, Portugal years later, bought a law in when they had the highest heroin um, outburst in the whole of Europe, yeah, in, in Portugal. And the government said, look, this is a fucking joke. Let's, let's look at this. All the money we put into these heroin addicts to stay in prison, yeah, is just wasting their money. Why don't we ban drugs from being illegal? So you can, drugs ain't illegal, buying them and selling them is, but like, you know, taking them is not illegal. But what we would do is when we when we do arrest these guys, we, what we do is we put them into schemes and we'll apply, we'll put them back into society because the studies started to show that it's about connection. So he started to put in these, um, and AIDS was rife out there by the by the way at the time. They started putting addicts back in the community. So if an addict was once a was once a what do you call it um, a mechanic, they'd get him on the get him on the methadone first of all. They'd put him in a little, they'd lock him up for a few weeks, let him get through his bits and pieces. And then they'll stick him back in the community as a job. And by reconnecting addicts, yeah, the, the, addiction, the addiction rate dropped. And now Arab Portugal's got one of the lowest addictions to drugs in, in Europe. And it's free. You, can, you can't get arrested for it. So they started reconnecting them. And then there was the thing like the Vietnam War. Yeah, 90 odd percent of the fucking soldiers, or 70 percent, I think it was, were scagheads. They're all backing up heroin and acid, right? They're out of war. When the Vietnam War ended, the government thought, fuck. You know, when they come back, we're going to have like this big problem of heroin addicts. It's going to be rife. They come back into their normal environment. They didn't touch drugs. There was no cravings. There was no nothing. They come back into the back into their normal environment where they were connected to their loved ones and their family, and they didn't have no cravings. They didn't ever addict. They never took heroin again. There was like a small percentage, like five percent might have done, but the rest of them never went back to it again because the environment weren't surrounded by death and cruelty and nothingness, and you know they wanted to, they were escaping. As soon as they put them back into their normal environment, there weren't no problems. Do you know an old lady can have a hip replacement? They give them, they give them diamorphine, which is 100% heroin. That is better than anything you're going to get off a smackhead dealer on the street. It's the purest heroin in the world, yeah? And do, do you ever see an old lady get ejected with heroin and three days later going, oh, I need to get a bit of brand. Can you, um, you know, start ringing a dealer? They don't. They don't they have any symptoms. They go through the process. They have, they have the diamorphine and then... That's it. it Whereas often they go back into their normal connected lives with their loved ones and their sisters and their cousins. That's what happens on a daily basis and people are not aware of that. So for addiction, and what people do is... So, they, yeah, so no, 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 it's about on. connection. What I'm trying to say is people take away the connection from the addict. So they'll try to punish them, shame them. You know, you, you ain't, if you keep doing that alcohol, you're not part of the family, you're a fucking embarrassment. You know, look what you've done, you've ruined your life, your girlfriend thinks you're an idiot, and we slate them and we run them down. So what we do is to try to help the addict is to dis, disconnect them even more. They're already disconnecting because they're not feeling good about their life or where they are, or they've got no future, they haven't got enough skills to be in that good area of their life because no one's taught them, because what I'm talking about today, no one fucking even talks about emotions. So, you know, they're disconnecting them even more. Then they, because what are they going to do? You're taking away the connection of love. They're going to go and do more drugs, more alcohol. We need to reconnect with our addicts and sit down and say, I want to sit with you. If I can be here for you anytime, I'll sit with you. And yeah, addicts are hard to love. Addicts are fucking nightmares. They're jars. But we have to, if you want to help a family who's a loved one with an addict, you need to show them connection and try to get them reconnected. And then they'll, they'll stop using again. You know, we've all been in places in our life where I'd say I've had addictions and, and dumb things because I was disconnecting from boredom. I had nothing wrong going. I was just fucking bored. I had no future goals. I was in a band. I like playing a gig in the sad. And the fuck all the dudes. I got stoned every day. Do you know what I'm saying? So looking at that, it was just disconnecting. What else was I going to fucking do? It's boring sitting around in a state and listening to the bollocks. You listen to every, every story. You was a gangster who stabbed her, who owes him money. That someone's been robbed. It's fucking boring, isn't it? In every day of your life, yeah? So we want to dis we want to disconnect. 
So it's about reconnecting the addicts, which really help an addict. Reconnection. And, and reconnecting them to... Love, to, people. To, to human beings. Human beings. What, human beings. What a lot of people don't realize, because a lot of people that haven't got addiction problems or addictive personalities, and they know somebody that has, and they're, they're spectating the car crash. Mm. They don't appreciate that a substance makes a hell of a companion. Mm. You're, not, you're not lonely when you've got substances in your system. And then, that becomes your friend. And then it becomes an habit. When you do something more than once, you do it again and again and again. The body rubs it as a subconscious program. And now the body craves it and you go and get it because now you've programmed the body to do that. Now you can't think greater than how you feel. You're fucked. You have to, re, you, have to you know, go but, through the, the, the change work. And realistically, addicts should be the best lovers because they're looking for connection. They're addicted to connection. They're going out their way to get connected to the substance. And if they was connected to a human being, they'd make the greatest lovers on the planet yeah. because they commit. But so they've not been taught love. They don't know how to love. Show, say they've all been shown is, all they've been done is run down and they've been, they've never had a good life and they don't know what love is. And, mm. you know, they know how to give it, but they don't know how to receive it. They don't know what, you know, they don't understand. They're confused. They've got to, re you've got to educate people emotionally. People don't, when did we was at school and someone go, oh, how do you feel? Oh, I feel a bit worried. In what way do you feel worried? I mean, is it in your chest? Where about does that feeling sit in your body? Is it in your chest? No one speaks to you about where is it in your body and how to manipulate the, the move it down, move it up. You think I'm a fucking nuts. We don't talk about our emotions. Who knows the difference between worry, fear, anxiety, or anticipation? Anticipation is a great thing. It's a learning state. It feels exactly, it feels like it's one of the negative ones. But when you do something for the first time, your five senses go on, on full alert. You don't know what's going to happen next. You get a little butterfly in your stomach. That's a learning state. That's a good feeling. So butterflies are anticipation. Can be. It can feel like it can feel very similar. You've got to, you've got to be educated to understand that when I go on a skiing lesson, I'm going to feel a little butterfly because I've never been down anyone's skis before. You on snow, you can fucking dive in the snow. You know you're not going to hurt yourself. But as you start moving, you feel a little bit like you've got nothing to, you know, balanced on skis before. Do you know what I'm saying? Ain't you do it two or three or four times, the anticipation dis disappears. Your first driving lesson, that first, first gear. Because like, I can't wait to drive, but people might get that. I, I, I don't associate the word anticipation with anything other than waiting. Yeah. I've, I've never thought of it as a, as a positive or a negative. I think the anticipation of something is I'm just sort of waiting for something. Yeah, you wait. You are sort of waiting, aren't you? You don't know what's going to happen next. You know, like your day at a first job. You can't wait. You have got a new job. When you get there in the morning, you're a little bit like, "What's going to happen here?" So you're waiting, yeah. waiting with nerves. It's not nerves. It's sort of it's it's awareness. Your five senses are on full awareness. Anticipation might be the wrong word. I can't think of the word then. But your your hearing, your seeing, your smell, your taste, your feelings are on full alert because it's never done this before. So you never met that. You've never seen that person in the office next to you because you've never been in the fucking office before. So you see him and you think, I wonder what he's like. And like you're, you're, all your senses are firing off. But once you get to know him and you get in there three or four days, you feel calm You because it's, it's an environment that you know. It's just it's just a little bit like anxiety, but it ain't. You, when you learn something emotionally, when you first kiss a girl when you're a kid, you want to give her a little snug. You, you don't want to be mugged off in my kiss in the right way. You know, that's that sort of shit. If I go to a, um, learn how to drive a motorbike, right? You, want to, you can't wait to learn to drive a motorbike, but you can't you jump on it, but you've still got that little bit of that feeling of what's going to happen next. How can, how can people, if their body's a vehicle, how can they steer themselves out of addiction? You have to get beyond the analytical mind. You have to get beyond the, the frequencies of the body. The body's telling you what to do. So the best way I could recommend on here... Because that, you... that will sound complicated to certainly an addict. The problem is it's so fucking easy, but it's, the, the fear of the unknown mm. scares people so fucking much. They'd rather stay as an addict in the known because they can predict how they're going to feel. When they go into the unknown, a meditation can be hard at first. People think, oh, it looks peaceful. It ain't fucking peaceful in there when you first start meditating. Your brain's going 100 miles an hour. You try shutting the cunt down. It goes, fuck you. I'll, think it, I'll make 58,000, 68,000 thoughts a day. Shut up, you mug. And it, it tries to fuck you off. You have, to, you have to learn how to shut it down. And the most simplest way to do that. And to meditate, to, 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 to meditate when you're clucking from your next hit of brown, how do you even no, you're do, fucked. You're how do you do that? You, you can't, can you? No, you're in the emotion of it. Sometimes you need to be stuck in a rehab. Someone, it's a, someone like an heroin addict, you need to be locked in a room and go through the fucking 72 hours of cold turkey before what, you can what, okay. think of anything. So what, what would you... You're not going to be feeling cold turkey and craving and be able to... So here's, here's a thing for you. And this isn't me talking out of school because uh, mm -hmm. your friend Dan, Daniel O'Reilly, yeah. aka Dapper Laughs, he talks about this now daily. Yeah. So... Someone like Dan, what would you say to him? Because what he says is his 
Beer and gear consumption got out of control. He wasn't a full-blown addict day in, day out, but he got out of control and it was affecting his relationships. And I think like a high percentage of lads out there will be doing exactly the same thing. Drinking too much, sniffing too much, has a knock-on effect to work relationships. If you want a big picture what would, you, what, what would you say to, not a full-blown smackhead, what would you say to somebody that's just overindulging to the point it's starting to fuck their lives? This is not an easy question because everyone's different. This is why psychotherapy don't work as good as me because I, I work with the individual. Your map of the world is different and he's and he's different than mine. So tell me what you do. So if I was to get anyone at home now listening. Use me. Use, use me as a guinea pig. Right. Rob, in, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you my problem. You, 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 you give me an idea of a solution. And this, this, I mean, I haven't drunk for months and I've got two wine racks there and I can stare at them all day long and I'm not even tempted. But for argument's sake, for the benefit of the podcast – and the benefit of your expertise and excellence. This is role play. I am drinking three times a week, and every time I drink, I then crave cocaine, and then I start sniffing cocaine. So, Rob, I spend half my week drunk and high, and I spend the rest of the week recovering from that. Help me break that cycle. What do you need to know about me? What's bothering me? My past experience, where I wanna be, do okay, I enjoy if it? If you want to make it, if I can make it so, so everyone can explain So we're it. not generalising. Yes, yeah, so we're not generalising. If I can make it easy to, it has to be generalising in, a, in a, a little bit because it's a podcast and I can't work with individuals. So as a generalised, which I don't know where I can answer this because it's for the, all the listeners, is to say you have to get beyond the analytical mind. You have to get beyond your emotions, yeah, because you're fucked if you're in that emotion. So I would state to anyone at home listening, in this environment, the first thing you should do is learn how to shut down your frequencies of your brain, meaning you have to get your frequency to drop from beta state into theta state. That means you're going from 16 hertz down to four to eight hertz. By doing that, all you have to do is cloak, put a bit of soft music on, on brain scans. We can see soft music quietens your brain waves straight away. So put a bit of soft meditation music. And I've got like 432 hertz, yeah, the manifestation code. We've put, we've put 432HZ into YouTube, loads have come up. You just press play, you sit in your chair, dim your lights, get relaxed, take a few deep breaths, get the oxygen into your blood. Then all you have to do is simple as this. Listen to the music. What will happen is your brain makes 58,000, 68,000 thoughts a day, a voice will pop up on million percent. It could even be a positive thing. Like, oh, you know what? I really enjoy listening to that thing. It doesn't matter what the word is, that is not fucking you. You know consciously your job is to listen to that music. So anything that does pop up is the unconscious. So what you do is you go sit down, remove it, and you go back to the music. 10, 20 seconds might pass, boom, it pops up again. Remove it, go back to music. And when I, it's fucking clever because sometimes I've had it go, yeah, the voices are gone now. It tells me exactly what I want to fucking hear so it can talk. The very it's, same voices. Yeah, the same voice. It's like, <laughs> you shouldn't be there. Fuck off. It's, it's, it's shrewd, you know? So, I've, yeah. got, I've got rid of it's, them. Yeah, that's what it actually does sometimes. The coast is clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's tricked you. Remove it, go back to music. And what will happen is by doing that, even within a few minutes, even a minute, you'll notice your breathing from your diaphragm starts to happen. Your body starts to go in a sleep-like state. So theta state is in between sleep and awake. Like when you first wake up in the morning and when you're you, like... So when you're you stirring... you wake is... up and you w go for a piss and you're hitting the walls and you're... That's theta state. Theta. Right? Theta. Theta. Sorry, like we've been here before. Like theta, yeah. That's the council so, coming out yeah, again. So, so, so what you're doing is you relax the brain waves down, yeah? And now the body's not there. The body's relaxed. There's no motion. Yeah, you breathe, you feel yourself breathing. And in that state, don't get me wrong, when you open your eyes, it's going to kick in still. But if you have to, it might take time. You have to take the body down. And then I want you to see your future. I want you to have wrote, written down or something of where you want to see yourself. So if you're an addict and you feel weak and skinny or if you're fat, see yourself in the body that you want. See yourself being the opposite, healthy. See yourself running along a beach. See yourself in holiday. See yourself achieving some sort of goal. Create, you need goals to move forward to for one. You need to go in the here and now to the future zone, which is going to be alien to you because you're too busy living in the here and now, escaping from the here and now because your thoughts are going to the past generally. You've got no future coming up. So we have to start first to understand you need that future. And then when you get beyond analytical little mind, you start visualizing that. <clears throat> and you're starting to reprogram your body. Your body starts to go, wow, that's fucking nice. We can feel like that, can we? Then you show it, it to it again. Then you show it. You can't miss a day. This is where people fuck up because it takes 30 days to build a new neuro pathway, which means it'll become automatic, like a subconscious program. So It takes 30 days to build a new one. They say 21 days to make an habit. It's bollocks. That's like a photographic memory. It's more like 28 to 30 days average. Me, it's seven weeks. I can feel it kick in, literally. I'm seven weeks. I'm well down the fucking line for me to create a neuro pathway. 
I think because my ADHD dyslexia takes me a bit longer. But anyway, so I close my eyes and, and I'll, I'll manifest, I'll visualize that state. I, nothing's saying you ain't going to get up tomorrow and get crap and, and go and do it again. But you have to keep doing it. You have to keep shutting the body down and you'll start noticing it being in more control. And then when you practice this to a point, just like a, like a pet, you know, like a, a dog, when you train a dog, sit, it runs off. Yeah, this is a Joe Dispenza quote, actually. The dog will run off. You go, get back here, sit down. At some point, your dog will obey you and it will sit when you tell it to sit. If you keep training a dog, telling it to sit, at some point, it will, it will surrender itself to you and it obeys you. That's what you've got to become, the master to the body again. And what happens is by practicing just that even, not even the visualization, just by going, move the voice, go back to music and sit in there. Yeah, you're starting to tell the boss, the body who's boss. After time, when things happen, like a bit of road, ra road rage, when you normally just react, bang, you, you fucking wanker, you're screaming out the window yourself. All of a sudden, you, you, have a, you have this little period where you go, I don't want to react. He's a mug. What's the point of that? And you start finding that you get these little short gaps before you react where you've got a choice. And you start telling the body, hang on, that ain't a good idea. Shut, shut, shut up. And this, this comes from practice. So I will say to any addict at home listening without having a session, please start disconnecting from your reality because we have to disconnect to reconnect. So we have to shut down these path, these, these circuitries and we have to rebuild new ones. So through visualization, when you're in that state, is the most powerful state to rewire your brain. You'll start making new feelings. You you start to rehearse the emotion of who you're going to be before you are it. So you learn to feel like you're a non-addict before you become a non-addict. So it's got to work. I've got to feel like a millionaire before I can become a millionaire. You've gone to touch base on the next thing I want to discuss a couple of times. And it's, it's three letters, but you say them really quick and it sounds like a word. And you said, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. now I want to come back to it. All right, we're... The reticular activating system. That's the one. It's a group of neurons at the bottom of the brain opposite the pituitary gland that works as a filtering system. We have to delete, distort, and generalize information. That's what our brain does. Otherwise, if we're talking all the information equally, our brain is shut down. So me, look, you looking at me now, what can you see behind me? Loads of stuff, yeah? And if you look at my glasses, the air on my head, the wrinkles on my face, the shirt, the, my, my scarf behind me, you have to take in everything that's in your peripheral vision equally your mind had shut down. It won't be able to cope with the amount of data coming in. So it deletes and only stays, takes in what you're focusing on. And that's your feelings. Uh, what you, listen, you can't, you're not focusing on it now, but I want you to just do me a favor. Just feel where your left earlobe is. Just put your attention there. Now you ask the brain, you start to notice where it is in time and space, right? Yeah, yeah. Now feel your left foot's little toe. It's yeah. weird, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the brain <laughs> yeah. is there. But otherwise, you're not asking input, you're asking for the focus. It won't show you because you've done your yeah. fucking business. What do you know that for? You're too busy looking, listening to me, making this conversation. The body's cool, it's, it's relaxed, and we're doing our thing. So if you had to think of every nerve ending of your body at the same time, you won't be able to fucking function. There's so much to you. There's, I mean, you're like the biggest onion I've ever met. <laughs> you keep chipping away. There's layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. And I think this is just going to be a nice taster for people to get a, to get a sample of. Robert Heisey. We'll do, next, we'll do part two next time. We can do a part two. We, we, well, we could pick a hundred subjects and, and we could run with it, but 100%. I want to know bef before, before you let people know where they can find you, because you're going to want to find him. People are going to find great comfort in you and they're going to find strength and you're going to change the way people think because hope is powerful and you dish that out of information, but you also tell them how to apply that and put it into practice, you know, Knowledge minus application ain't worth a wank. You apply your knowledge, which is what you're giving people and encouraging them, sensational. So before you tell people where they can find you, your website, your socials, the rest of it, tell me about what you've got, because you've got a film that, yeah. you're, that, that, that you're, you're producing, directing, funding, yeah, producing, yeah. and you've also got an app that's, that's in the making as well. So it's nearly finished, yeah. So it, in, in whichever order, and I'm just going to listen, but tell me about the film and tell me about the app because they're both interesting. Okay, I've got the, um, me and my business partner and a guy called Eddie Richardson. Um, it's a movie about the Richardsons. They're, the, if you don't know who they are, they were gangsters in South London during the times of the craze. So the craze had East London, South London, we had the Richardsons, they're known as the torture gang, you know, very violent, strong people, and also, though, they were great businessmen. They had a very big um, name across London for their scrapyards and other businesses and nightclubs and what else they had. Um, so it's, it's a different story than the craze, 
in the way the way it's being filmed it's going to be done more not so much glamorous but real hard you know and it also i don't want to give too much away actually because the story hasn't been told and it's it's it properly and um i don't want to give too much away but it's about the richardsons anyway so if you don't know who they are type in the richardsons talk to you going on the richardsons and you might see some documentaries you very rarely see eddie on there Eddie wants to keep it, and we do. We want to keep it as real as possible because he's got, I mean, he's given us so many stories. They're unbelievable. Some of them are funny, and they're they're very violent. He did not fuck about this little firm. So um, you've got no man, Frankie Fraser, and people like that in there. It's, it's a proper bit of work, how they run the you, West you'll End. Have, you'll have to they're cast the old, that role. Bill on the fiddle. Oh, we've left... got, we've got, I can't say we've got him. No, mind, no, no. We've got some great cast. Don't worry. We've got some great Because all these, ga all these gangster stories have, have been told so many this times. This be... The, the, the business, all the, all the, like the rise yeah. of the foot soldiers, this is going to be different. This is going to be filmed more in, you know, the colours and things we've got and the tones are more of like darker, like, you know, the Peaky Blinders, the Godfather, that sort of tone. No by mouth the... tone? Sort of even, yeah, dark. sort of dark. Yeah, more real, you know, street, with London. It's going to be more real. We're not trying to emphasise, there will be glamour in there because it's the West End and things as well, but it's going to be, you know, we don't, we, we don't want to give too much away, but, you know, the way we want to film it is like, you know, with a horror movie um effect to the scenes when some you know when it got into business we want to, we want to show you it ain't glad we want to show you the, 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 well, the some of the violence the was was horrific yeah i mean they put actors, so why you know actors in what, people's heads and you like, can't polish people's it fingers off and mm. you know trying to you know there's loads of stories you cannot I mean you can't sugarcoat chopping off someone's limbs I mean, can you? You can't. No. <laughs> you can't make you can't. it look pleasant. No, you can't. <laughs> I mean, the opening scene is going to be violent, straight into straight into a bit of action. You know, it's going to be, and and, and one thing that people are going to be blown away by, we've got Eddie Richardson in the film. The, so it's like having John Gotti in John Gotti. He ain't in that whole film. I don't want to give it away. There's a little couple of parts of Eddie's in it, but Eddie Richardson's going to be in the Richardsons, which has never happened as far and, and, as I'm so, aware. So what what is your exact role in the project? You're the director. We produced it. I sort of put it together. One of the producers. Yeah, you're put you're, you're producing together. it, getting the funding. I've got, I've got Eddie. I've got my pal as a director. We've opened a company. Then we, we're between us. We're, we're getting the actors. I'm talking to actors. I'm talking to people. We're getting the sets. I've, I've um, raised... I'm getting all the... Um, the capital. The, the capital, basically. I'm bringing in investors. That's what I've been doing. I've been getting them in. I'm good at you know making contacts, kicking fucking doors down. And then my pal's really educated in the financial side. And we sit down and we talk and I let him do his thing. He's like, this is his thing. You know, this is what he does. He's great. Um, he's been in Hollywood for 11 years and he's over here now. Um, we've got another lady, um, a lady producer who's helping us set the sets and work the times and all the maths like that goes into the into the investment they get kickbacks and businesses and it's like it's, it's, it's a lot into it but i've got good and learn here and I'm, I'm i'm loving it you know it's a good buzz but you know my my passion is in my app the manifestation app. yeah this is, they've so, had they've had they've had the richardson's film teaser yeah yeah that's enough for them yeah 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 now tell, the, me, tell the, me about the, tell me about your app the, this so the, this app, app this, you're be, building it yeah it's been built for a year and a half you've got a website already uh, i've got a, that's yeah i've got a website for um to myself, www.thehypnotistman.com. If anyone wants unconscious mind therapy, please come to there or Robert I C H I S E E one word on Instagram or Facebook. Um, and your sorry, and, and your retreat you do. I've you... got yeah the holistic retreat in my bio I own, which is a body and mind retreat where you don't just do the fitness, you also you, you get mind therapy and you know beautiful villas. Uh, you know, I've not doing no more this year i'm starting up again next april i've done one this year but next year i'm gonna start making more of a fuss i've got so much on this year i've had to sort of and if people was interested in cut myself uh in the holistic retreats would they go and book that through your website <coughs> um there's a website for that www.theholisticretreat.com okay or so the holistic retreat underscore on instagram so that's two websites that they need to bookmark yep, yes. one to find you the hypnotist one to, man one to find your retreats me, the holistic retreat dot com is the, the retreat um the, the app will be coming out on the app store and the first week of october second week of october the manifestation app is going to be absolutely amazing we've put so much into it we've looked at things like um headspace we've looked at calms and we've we've grew on this so, and there's and what we've done is we're making mental health trying to keep it a bit trendy so it's not oh oh doom and gloom let's talk about the past which i which we will do on there i don't want to make it like them other apps i want it to be that people go wow this is a cool thing 
So that's why we've gone into manifestation because as I spoke to you on the podcast here and now to the future is where success lives. So manifestation is, you know, that's where manifestation lives. So we call it the manifestation app. It's got, it's got a journal in there so you can journal. You've got a daily re- um, projection. You've got um, a daily review. You've got um, mood trackers. You've got a, a, um, a calendar where you can go back in 10 years, look back what you was journaling 10 years ago if you want. It's going to record everything. We've got the the... University Frequency of Thought Academy, the UFTA, we called it. And that's when you open up that. So, like, really, we've got, like, four or five apps in one app. That's, we're giving so much fucking value. So when you open that up, that's like your calms in a way, but with more detail. You're not just having you're not having LeBron James in your fucking bedtime story and a few meditations. We've got real therapy, unconscious mind therapy, yeah, um, in there. We're going to have the, the law, 12 laws of the universe. People talk about law of attraction. You first got to understand the law of the vibration, the law of divine oneness before you're going to start even entering that world. Then you've got the law of polarity. The, you know, there's, there's loads of loads and loads of laws, yeah? Um, so we're teaching you about this. Um, and there's like loads of meditations. What I'm talking about, taking you into theta state to help you reprogram your mind and from anxiety to depression to success to happiness, whatever it may be, even sleep. Um, so, and there's just music for you to meditate to as well in this. That's going to be a big, that's a big page. We're having a podcast in there eventually, the Manifestation Podcast. We've already done Michael Bispin, the UFC world champion, a karate world champion. We've got some other massive names coming on, but I'll keep that, keep that low. That first always began in the app for a month before it come out onto the podcast scene. So it'll be dedicated to the app first and then we'll release it on YouTube. And it's all, then it's um, got in there. Oh, they've got a secret feature. What no one's done in mental health apps yet. I'm keeping my mouth shut on that one. I'm like, you see me smiling now. I'm so excited <laughs> because it's going to be fucking mind blowing for the first time of, uh, of this to be experienced in mental health apps. There's, yep, there's no, there's not one done yet. So we're going to be, it's, it's going to, it's got a new innovative thing in there. Yeah. Um, and there's, um, there will be a shop eventually and other stuff that it's going to keep building. My idea is to turn it into a fuck. Oh, we've also got like a Facebook. I forgot about that, the social media page. So it's a safe place to people to come because it's a subscription based. You ain't going to get any trolls because we know who the fuck they are. And if there's no free strikes and now you fuck about and then upset someone, boom, you're blocked from them. We call it the temple. So you, you're at the temple. You never come back in. There's no fuck about it. You want it to be a safe place for people to talk about mental health in a good way, in a moving forward way. And anyone's got, you know, problems they can talk and, this and is, interact. This is a- Facebook group. This is a, no, it's not Facebook. It's my own one called the Temple. I built up. I'm, 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 a, I'm um, comparing it to Facebook, but it's called. It's oh, I called see. The Temple. But it's, it's got stories like Instagram. So this is a website it's got as a well. Wall. I'm, I'm going to put it into a website eventually. I will do. Yeah. So I, how, I, how, how do people get to the Temple? In the app. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So, so that, you've got com- like, imagine having an app with Facebook on it, but it's not Facebook. It's a temple. Right. So, do you know what I'm saying? So we've got like a nice temple thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you go in a temple, it's a place of harmony where people can sit and talk to each other and talk about things and they can pose positive affirmations and they can talk about fucking microdosing or whatever's good for the brain or, you know, anxiety, confidence, whatever they want to talk about. It's a safe environment to, to go in and talk about and we'll, we'll monitor that and we're going to build that up. Um, as we go, it's taken it's put us back a couple of weeks, mate. Because I want a story post in there as well. You know, I don't want to be fucking last year. I want to be in with you know, keep up with them. So we're having that all built. So it's got a real. It's a. It's not just an app. It's a world. You know, it's like a. It's a safe place for the mind, and it'll have everything in there to help you. And and um and it will keep growing. And the more we do it, the more people we get in there. I mean, I love to have sections with people like yourself who's been through stuff and have this and have like a story section and you know and you know. I just want so much content that people can learn and with love and, and hope and people coming from all different walks of life. Like a mental so health it's, university. It's a, yeah, yeah. I suppose, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. And it's like everything that I've sort of worked for is going into it. It's so much love and passion um, to put this out there. So that's so you, coming you, you, out. Your entire professional career, knowledge, love, energy we'll, we'll going is to, yeah, going in. Into, yeah, and, the, it will, and it will be still. You know, We've still got more things that we want to go in there to apply but yes everything's going into it 100 percent. and it's it's subscription based subscription based yeah got to be subscription based you're putting too much into it for it not to be and it's also there's too much value it's not uh you're not creating an app no, where, where people can not, add, add a filter to a picture I mean, this is knowledge yeah, it ain't like if you, i mean it calms is the leading one it's got more features than headspace and then in calms it's the why well, i see meditation and stories you know what the fucking else do you know and that's got that has two million subscribers so we read uh, what? No, two and a half million subscribers that's got. So every month they're getting like 25 mil. It's fucking mental. I'll be giving that straight. I'll be fucking, I can't wait to get that because I've got dreams, visions of opening my unconscious mind therapy schools. Because my, what people don't really understand is behind all this, 
when I crack it, when I've got all my things moving, I want to go back to working class areas. Yeah. This is a personal dream of mine. This is nothing to do with, this is a, this is my dream from day one when I started learning the mind when it hit me. But I want to go back eventually and have UMT academies donated for free to working class areas, not middle class areas, because I brought up in a working class area. There ain't no fucking help. You can blag it, yeah? Oh, you know, yeah, it's, you know, there's help there. There's no fucking help in working class. Dan, I mean, about lower working class areas and council states. There's no fucking love there. Um, you're, you're talking about, the, you're put, talking about the bottom end forgotten people. Yes, like, I was, see, when I was brought up, there were stabbings everywhere. Oh, there's stabbings, it's so bad. Mate, the world's never changed for me on the old Kent Road. I'll see stabbings at 11. Mm. So for me, people always, I've got mates with loads of stab holes in them. It's normal, yeah? Um, so stabbings for me was was bad. But when I moved out to Sick Up, when I was about, I don't know, 25, 26, moved out to Sick Up, right? And when I moved that, there was no stabbings. And I remember you didn't hear things like that. And then there was a stabbing. That some middle class kids got stabbed to death. It was a tragi tragedy, but he's not a drug dealer. So... You know, you knock a drug dealer. That's what comes with the fucking territory. You, you can play dumb if you want, but mm. you don't knock drug dealers. You know, anyway, he's come in and stabbed him. The poor kid dies. Right? I mean, I've done, you know, it's terrible, right? It was in every national newspaper. It was on the fucking news. I remember thinking, what the fuck's so special about him? That was just my young, innocent mind not being worldly yet. Like, why the fuck does that get on the news? And I see every week, no one gives a fuck. Mm. No one gives a fuck in South London who gets stabbed and shot because you're just scumbags. You want a council state, you're nothing. You, you, you're, you're, you you know, get a stab in the middle class area. It goes everywhere. So I was brought up with no swings in my fucking park. I mean, an oil point down the slides. It was, it was fucked. So I have a big passion from the pain of the upbringing and the poverty that I would love to have unconscious mind therapy because I believe working class kids are stabbing for 20 quid if you knock them. Yeah, a lot of the young kids, they're thick as shit. They don't mean to do it, but they've got to you know, keep up their level of street cred or whatever. So if you're someone that's stabbing for 20 quid, imagine if you could teach these kids vision. Imagine if you could teach them that this ain't the way, this is how you can make money and be fucking successful and have a great life. The minute that clicks, they're going to work 50 times harder than any fucking middle class kid or upper class kid because they're hungry. They're hungry. They want to come out the gutter. They don't want to go and stab people and sell fucking drugs. They ain't what they want to do. They, got, they don't believe in us. There's another fucking option. That's all. The only people around me when I grew up was armed robbers or drug dealers. So what did I want to be? That's what I wanted to be. I watched Goodfellas every day. Like it was a fucking, you know, that's what working class kids do. We're fucking brainwashed. Because the only people on the estate with the, with the money and the girls and the nice clothes was the fucking drug dealers that you looked up to. It wasn't your mum and dad on building sites. They didn't have fuck all. It was the ones that had the nice cars were the gangsters and the drug dealers. And so you're already inspired by that. And you look at anyone outside of that not to understand who you are. Because people don't understand the report of living on the streets and living in the streets. They don't understand it. And so there's a lot of working class people who don't even understand it because they weren't in that deep and dark environment. So my passion is to go Mossai Manchester, Toxteth Liverpool, Bermondsey, Brixton, fucking, I don't care. Put me in the ghettos of anywhere and I want to put things in place to working class kids to learn about them one because we're going to see more millionaires, more successful athletes, more successful people because they're fucking hungry. And when someone's in that, in them dark places, they want, and they see the light, you try stopping them. As I said, half of them stab you for 20 quid. Imagine what they're going to do if they see success on an easy plate. They're going to think, fuck me, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine, I would have done. Imagine, imagine if they can see a, a, a road map to yes. earn in a hundred grand yeah. legitimately yeah. without topping someone. And easy. Yeah. And enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. So you get it. So we're going from the we're going from the app to the UMT Academy where you're going to help the forgotten people. In the, that's in the future. That's, that's, that's my the, that's my I've gone off track here. That's that's my future. that's what my future. That's what I want when I die. I want that to be my legacy. And you've done that and you shared that with us because you are living between the now and the, the future. future. You know, brother, you got that. I love that. Rob, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for coming Thanks, on. Yeah, mate. You ended thank that you. on a high note and I've loved this. I've lo I hope you've loved it. I've loved, I've loved it. it. We're going to have a bit of steak. Let's go. And I'll see you next time on the Dozen Podcast. See you soon. Cheers, Take brother.